Laurel, is a city in Maryland located between Washington and Baltimore. It has a population of around 25,000, so it is quite easy to hear about things going on. This might be a reason why Detective Joseph Bellino found himself asking his superiors to give him more challenging cases. The more challenging the case, the better his odds of making a name for himself. But the challenge he was looking for ended up being one of the worst homicides he had ever seen. Hello, welcome to the video. Today, I give you the details about a double homicide purely fueled by pure jealousy and hatred. Remember to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Anne is a private care nurse in a hurry to get to her morning appointment. She knocks on Tina Toller's door, but gets no response. She is taking care of Jasmine Toller, Tina's 26-year-old suffering from cerebral palsy. She had been diagnosed with a horrible illness at birth and given three months to live. Fortunately, she was still kicking it. However, her illness is so severe that she cannot perform basic physical activities like walking or talking. Anne calls out again, but the house is dead silent. This is so unlike the family, so Anne approaches the back door. To her surprise, the door is unlocked. Anne gets into the house and starts calling out to Tina and her boyfriend, James Ferguson. When she hears no reply, she advances to the bedroom, where she witnesses a sight that will traumatize her for days to come. Tina and James have been brutally slain in a horrific scene. Joseph Bellino is on the way to work when he gets the call about the murder. He rushes to the scene and finds that Tina's daughter Jasmine was at the crime scene unharmed. She is rushed to the hospital to confirm that she is well, and Anne goes with her. He walks toward the bedroom to investigate the crime scene. The bedroom door has been forced open. There is blood splatter on the walls, on the ceiling, and the floor. All these suggest that the culprit had committed the murders in a fit of rage. There are a few pots, pans, and a shattered flower vase, meaning that the victims had tried to put up a fight. Tina is lying at the foot of the bed. She has multiple stab wounds on her lower back and her face is heavily bruised, showing heavy beating. What catches the detective's attention is that there is an engraving of the word Eve on her forehead. James is lying next to Tina. He has stab wounds on his face, hands, and chest. Bellino wonders if this could be a case of murder-suicide, but he quickly dismisses this theory. James's heavily beaten face shows that he couldn't have beaten himself up, and Tina is incapable of inflicting such injuries. Bellino realizes that James has a pouch on his belt. The pouch is empty and open, signaling that his knife is somewhere. The detective finds the said knife in the bathroom, but it is next to a bar of soap, showing that lifting evidence from the cleaned knife might be impossible. A sweep of the house shows that nothing was stolen. The house's main door has no sign of forced entry, so the couple must have known and welcomed their killer. Luckily, the detective has an eyewitness, Jasmine. Jasmine is taken care of by two nurses, and in the morning and another one in the afternoon. The afternoon nurse leaves at around 8 in the evening, so Tina cares for Jasmine well into the morning. Bellino goes to the hospital to ask Jasmine what she knows. However, Anne mentions that Jasmine's condition is so bad that she may not understand what the detective is asking. The neighborhood canvas reveals that Tina was married to a man called Jay. Jay was also spotted at the crime scene, so he is called in for questioning. Could this be a jilted lover? Bellino quickly dismisses this theory as well, since Jay seems completely devastated and shaken by his ex-wife's death. Jay reveals that the two had been married, and he had cared for Jasmine as though she was his own. Unfortunately, the couple's son was diagnosed with cancer at two years old and passed on when he turned three. The death overwhelmed Tina, and she and Jay drifted apart. Soon, they decided to call their marriage quits. However, the two were still friendly to each other. He cared deeply about Tina and would most of the time join the family for meals and drinks. Jay reveals that on the day of Tina's murder, he had gone home, watched TV, and then slept. While this is not a perfect alibi, Bellino realizes that Jay is willing to be as helpful as possible, so that may rule him out as a suspect. Jay mentions that his roommate should be able to vouch for him, as he had seen him get in the house. Bellino calls Jay's roommate, Thurston Lamont Yerby to confirm Jay's alibi. Lamont confirms that he had seen Jay come into their shared apartment, and he had never left. Bellino asks Lamont for a written statement, but Lamont claims that he is out of town, and he will give the statement as soon as he is back. Bellino soon gets news from the autopsy report. Both bodies have some alcohol amounts in the system. James's cause of death had been multiple stab wounds while Tina had suffered from blunt force trauma and stab wounds, and the assailant had attempted to strangle her. At this point, Bellino realizes that he is looking for a murderer who had a deep hate for Tina and that she might have been the intended victim and James had just gotten in the way. Bellino also realizes something that shocks him even more. The eve on Tina's head is from a flashlight made by the Ever Ready Company. Tina's assailant had beaten her up with the flashlight so bad that it left its imprint on her forehead. Bellino has no leads at this time, 
so he does some research on cerebral palsy to see if he can communicate with Jasmine. The interview goes as expected, since Jasmine cannot understand or respond to the detective's questions. Bellino realizes that the assailant had left Jasmine alive, knowing that she could never identify him. Bellino has another neighborhood search and one resident gives him a lead. She had come home at around 11 in the evening and had seen a large white SUV parked outside Tina's house. Inside the car was a man wearing a baseball cap and smoking. The forensics team comes through with some evidence as well. There was a garbage can retrieved from Tina's house. The contents reveal a nurse's coat and several beer cans. The evidence shows that the nurse had left for the night. The beer cans have the DNA of James and another unidentifiable one. Jay is called in, and he freely agrees to have his DNA tested. Of course, it is not a match. Soon, Lamont comes to the station to provide his statement. Bellino asks Lamont if he can have his DNA sample, but Lamont lawyers up. Bellino sees this as a huge red flag. He gives Lamont some water. Lamont finishes the water and carries the empty bottle with him. The same goes for the cigarette butt. Bellino continues asking Lamont questions and learns that he had started living with Jay as he was working for Jay's construction company. Lamont mentions that he had worked with James a couple of times, but he had never seen Tina. As Bellino watches Lamont leave, he is sure that he has his prime suspect. Someone had schooled Lamont about DNA and how to ensure that it is not left behind. Bellino has a couple of officers look into Lamont. One man hears them talking about Lamont. He volunteers information that is what Bellino needs. The man mentions that Lamont liked to party hard with alcohol and cocaine. On the night of Tina's murder, he had snorted some cocaine and started groping women at the bar. He had been kicked out and had promised to get some from his lady. The witness also mentions that he had seen Lamont and Tina in a local motel, in bed together. Bellino realizes that Lamont had lied in his statement as he had clearly had an affair with Tina without James's knowledge. That night, he had superhuman strength and vitality thanks to the cocaine. The witness seals the deal by pointing out that Lamont was driving a large white SUV. Bellino gets a warrant to collect a DNA sample from Lamont. All through, Lamont is cocky and arrogant, believing that the cops are harassing him for no reason. The DNA results come back, and it is a match to the beer cans in the garbage cans, and they also match some DNA lifted from the folding knife. Bellino gets a warrant for arrest and drives to Lamont's house. Lamont gets into a car and drives away. Bellino is careful as he does not want to cause havoc to the small community. He follows Lamont to an elementary school where his girlfriend works. Lamont sits around, and the police wait until the kids leave school. They arrest Lamont and bring him in. Bellino visualizes how the crime went down. Lamont had been horny from his party methods, so he decided to lay with Tina as he had before. He knocks on Tina's door, but Tina is with James. Since they've worked together before, James invites Lamont in, and they have a couple of beers. Lamont continues to act as if this is a social visit until James goes to the bathroom. He tries taking advantage of Tina, but she runs to the bedroom. Lamont follows her and starts beating her. James comes in and calls out to Lamont. He removes his folding knife from the pouch, but Lamont is stronger thanks to the coke. He beats up James and then stabs him 15 times. He goes ahead to attack Tina, who has retreated to the corner. After killing her, he sees Jasmine in bed. He covers the girl with a sheet. He walks to the bathroom to clean up. He decides to spare Jasmine since there is no way that she can ever identify him. Thurston Lamont was found guilty of two counts of second-degree murders, and he is serving two 30 years to life imprisonment. And this case closed. Our thoughts and prayers go to those who suffered under the hands of this particular man. If you want to watch more true crime documentaries, then, click any video of them. And don't forget to like this video. And subscribe for great content, and enjoy more. See you soon.